Hey everybody, it's P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions and The Break It Down Show. Today's guest is Jeff Butch. He is a teacher of Navy SEALs. He's an advanced swimming guy. And I thought we'd have him on to kind of talk about swimming at a high level, but also bring the combat aspect of SEALs in to have a conversation. And I think you're really going to enjoy this one. Look, here's the thing. When you're on a combat mission, wherever you go, however you get there, you can't be so tired and worn out from carrying all your gear that you can't be combat effective when you get there. So you think about SEALs, if they're going to insert through the water, you know, they're going to carry all of their stuff and then get to the objective where that's the start of their day. And if they exfil, if they leave the combat zone via a underwater insertion, again, like you're vulnerable. You're just the slowest you're probably going to move and you're exhausted. You've been doing this for 12, 16, 20, 36 hours straight and now you have to swim somewhere. So Jeff helps these guys be as efficient as possible. I want to mention some of Jeff's background. He's been an All-American swimmer, a member of the U.S. swim team. He's still an elite master class swimmer. He won the Alcatraz Shark Fest. He's an open water marathoner. He's an ambassador for the Navy SEAL Fund. You remember that fund from our episode with Johnny Walker and Duke Carbon from a while back. And I wanted to also mention Blue Mind, the surprising science that shows how being near, in, or underwater can make you happier, healthier, more connected, and better at what you do by Wallace J. Nichols. It's a book that Jeff and I talk about, and I actually have been going through it now, and I find it as a water goer. It's fascinating. So if you're like me, you like the water, I think you'll get something out of that book. It's called Blue Mind. If you look it up, you'll see it. I'll also put it in the show notes for you. One real other quick thing. Jeff doesn't just teach seals how to swim. He teaches swimmers how to swim. So if you go to his website, www.streamlinedperformance.com, streamlinedperformance.com. You will be able to see what Jeff does and get an idea of how he teaches people how to swim. It's not just combat side stroke. He he can teach you anything. So and finally, uh, one more shout out to Robert Farah, who set this up. Robert, who is the author of A Warrior's Faith and another book about to come out. Robert is a, a good friend of the show and a, and a friend of mine personally. And I, I just love the heck out of him. We're going to be doing more and more stuff in the future. He's uh, he's a big part of what we do around here. And then finally, thanks to you all. I mean, there are so, so many of you out there. And even if we're not connected directly, and I encourage all of you to reach out on social media, P.A. Turner. Even if we're not connected directly, I, I see you when I track show performance. And our audience in Asia is exploding. Our audience in Europe is already massive and getting bigger. Obviously, in the Americas, North and South, we're doing really well. Down in Australia, New Zealand, Cat Connor out there. It's it's incredible to know that you're all out there and that we're doing this together. And truly, when I go up when I get up to go do this work, I think, man, these guys are counting on me to do things. And it's neat to be able to do this with all of you. So thank all of you guys for listening, for buying the shirts, for participating, however you do it. If you want to be on an album fight, hit me up. We're looking for judges all the time. And thank you for everything. Now here's Jeff Uch. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Okay, I'm Jeff Uch, a tactical swim instructor for the Naval Special Warfare Community, i.e. Navy SEALs here with the Break It Down show, ready to talk swimming. And now, the Break It Down show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, so for those that don't know, uh, I love to swim. It's one of my favorite physical activities to do. And Bob Vera and I were talking about swimming. He's like, I've got the perfect guest for you. Because one, we love to introduce all of you to these incredible people that we find in our life. And, and Jeff is certainly one of those people. Also, we've been doing a lot. Just, you know, I'm about to be 50. John's about to be 50. Scott's about to be 50. Pete Koch is 50. All these are people that you you hear from on the show. We're all trying to figure out how to keep active, how to contain or build, build and retain muscle mass, how, how to increase bone density. You know, all of these things are going to allow us to move the next 30 years of our life. It's neat to be able to examine these different types topics because this way may not be your way but there is a way that works for you and i i love swimming and so i can't wait to talk to jeff about this uh it doesn't get any better than teaching seals how to swim i mean these guys 
they are physical specimens and to take and improve their ability man what a what a neat job to do so jeff is here to talk about that hat tip to bob for setting us up jeff let's talk swimming man absolutely love it been a large part of my life since i was since i actually failed my first swimming instruction uh the YMCA <laughs> when I was five or six and told, yeah, he'll never amount to much of a swimmer. Right. And you know, how many people actually fail their YMCA classes? Uh, well, you're talking to one right here. <laughs> <laughs> what was your, uh, what was your bugaboo? You just didn't have it together yet. Your body didn't work right yet. Were you young or what was the deal? Yeah, I think it was a matter of, you know, I wanted to go play while they were doing their, instructing and i think the the instructors just got a little frustrated with me that's all i can see that i can see that so okay you you figure out swimming as you mature a little bit and you get competitive i'm assuming so tell me about your competitive background absolutely well my mom was wanted me to become a competitive swimmer you know i was playing football baseball as a kid but she told this parent to tell me that i looked pretty good after this little summer league race and so I did a 25 freestyle and the lady said, Hey, you look great. And I was like, really? Wow. That's the first time anybody's told me about that in the water. And I believed her. I didn't know for years, literally till I was out of college, did my mom tell me that story. And it kind of deflated me a little bit that she would trick me because it did change my life. Instead of staying into football and baseball, I decided, Hey, uh, swimming is what, what I'm going to be doing. Were you good at football and baseball? You know, I kind of like to think I was, oh, you know, as right. a, but I was heavy. I was heavy. So in my day, if you were too heavy, at least in Chesterfield County, Virginia, you had to wear a white stripe across your helmet. So mm -hmm. you couldn't carry the ball. So I was a blocker in this. But, you know, I could throw the ball. They wanted me to be quarterback, but I was too heavy to do it, which I think, you know, what a shame. You know, that these that the young kids that were too heavy and kind of a little thick couldn't do that. But they were worried about, you know, running over the smaller kids. And so to me, even today, that doesn't make much sense. But yeah, uh, that yeah. was the way it is. What is your preferred stroke to get across the pool? Well, preferred stroke, you know, that's a good question, because I teach the preferred stroke is depending on, you know, what you're carrying, you know, with just a suit and goggles in your in your you know, clean other than that, uh, slick body freestyle, uh -huh. you know, is the most efficient stroke ever invented. But when we get into teaching Navy, the Navy guys, you know, if you've got boots and camis on and the camis are heavier, you're towing a rucksack and got fins on freestyle is not always the most efficient stroke. And we kind of teach that by experience, letting them play around with freestyle, trying to pull a rucksack or big boots and camis on and you learn very quickly that that's not the best way to go. Hey, this is Pete. Real quick, I just want to let you guys know we are proud to announce our official support of Save the Brave, a certified nonprofit 501c3 with a charter of helping veterans with post-traumatic stress. Here's how you can help. Go to savethebrave.com, click on the link on the website, and my recommendation is this. Subscribe. Give them 20 bucks a month. You've got subscriptions that you can turn off right now that you're not using that are $20 a month. Swap that out. Get involved. Let's help these folks out. And you learn very quickly that that's not the best way to go. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense because I would imagine, I think this is true, for a very short distance, butterfly is faster than freestyle. Is, is that correct? Well, it actually, yeah, well, look, at the Olympics, even at the 50-meter sprint, uh -huh. Everybody's still doing freestyle. Right, right. Now, on the so so butterfly is actually not faster. The butterfly kick underwater is faster. Aha. Uh -huh. okay. okay. Than any other stroke. So they'll do a couple butterflies and come up. And what's kind of interesting on the butterfly stroke, because you're pulling both arms at the same time, your velocity reaches a higher velocity than you ever reach in freestyle. But as you recover the stroke, you actually decrease, you know, uh -huh. much quicker than you do in freestyle. Freestyle is more of a constant velocity curve. It's not. You still have the up and downs, right. but it is a flatter uh, curve if you were to cycle through, you know, in, in, in graph velocity versus time. 
freestyles a lot flatter sine wave than the butterfly. Butterfly would go up and down. Right. So I, I guess what I'm thinking is that as you get loaded down, your ability to maintain that uh, velocity in, in Australian crawl freestyle or whatever, the front crawl, whatever you want to call it, um, it becomes – you know, it becomes too much in your body physically to move all that stuff, your boots, your camis, your backpack. And so you have to go to more of a survival stroke. And that's why there's a thing called combat side stroke. Is, am I getting this right? You are. Well, it more has to do with bringing something out of the water. You know, if you've got clothes on, you know, and you're in your toe and stuff. It, it becomes much easier to do an underwater recovery stroke. Mm-hmm. The reason freestyle that we recover out of the water is because we're, you know, going against the resistance of air, which is 770 times less dense than water. So, you know, with freestyle, I want to get it out and quickly back around. It's not going to be as efficient. But when you've got a lot of stuff on, you're not going that fast. Yeah. And so you kind of bring that arm up a lot easier. And if you've got long, cam- you know, a long sleeve cami on with all sorts of gear on your arm, even trying to get that out of the water, it's just a lot easier to just – sneak it up past the head and to the front and do those strokes. So a lot more of an efficient stroke. So if, if you guys are going, what the hell are these guys talking about? This is Jeff yeah. Uch. His website is jeffuch.com, U-T-S-C-H. Jeff, like you'd spell J-E-F-F, Uch. Go there and you can start to get an idea of what he does. And if you're into swimming, this is the guy to talk to. Uh, you can also right. check out... Say again. Also, I wanted to mention I've got a specific swimming website at streamlinedperformance.com. Okay. So that is the swimming specific website. And then I have that other one, jeffwitch.com. And, and if you get lost in all that, obviously, you can always reach out to me at PDA Turner and all social media channels, and I will get you connected with Jeff. Jeff is also on Facebook. Uh, so we can definitely get a hold of him. And what I want to encourage folks to do is go, yeah, you know what? Maybe I will try swimming. Or or if you already swim, maybe I'll try some different things, like a thing like combat side stroke and everything. Uh, one thing that um, I like to talk about in terms of swimming, because I like to talk about swimming, is are the number of strokes. Like if you ask someone, can you name 10 strokes? Most people can't name 10. But there must be 50 different strokes because there's like the double back trudging, you know, the regular <laughs> trudging. That's probably a Russian trudging out there somewhere. What is your favorite obscure stroke? <laughs> you know, the favorite obscure stroke is probably the butterfly bob. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? <laughs> okay. So the butterfly bob we learned as young kids. So if you if you have a real deep pool, you can't do this. But if your pool is three to five feet deep, you basically take a butterfly stroke. You go all the way down to the bottom of the pool, and then you kick off the bottom and come up really fast and come out like a dolphin from the top of the water, swing both arms above your head, and then dive back down to the bottom. So you kind of go up and down a little bit like you might see some triathletes do as they're getting into deeper water, you know, from kind of the mildly shallow out butterfly bobbing up on top of the water, back down and then pushing off and then, and then getting back down. It's kind of a fun stroke, get a little leg exercise, push off the bottom of the pool and uh, it looks kind of crazy. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a fan of the forward backstroke. Okay. The uh, forward backstroke. All right. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I've heard of that one. So give me a visual. Um, you, um, oh, are you laying on your stomach and straight arming it? N- no, you're laying on your back, going in the opposite direction. It's probably the best way okay. to say it. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Just because, like, I don't, you know, or, or um, I don't know what they call it, but the one where you're like, you do a backstroke followed by a crawl stroke followed by a, ba- and you just spiral in the water. You yeah, know, I don't know what well, possible. That- Huh? Yeah, that's fun. Well, freestyle and backstroke are both long axis strokes. So that means we rotate about the long axis, you know, mm-hmm. from your head down to your feet. Or butterfly and breaststroke are short axis strokes. So we kind of use the, sh- the pivot from the hips to generate power. Yeah. So, yeah, you're, it is kind of fun going in a corkscrew. You can go one stroke, backstroke into one freestyle and keep spinning round and round. You know, I get very dizzy doing that. Kids <laughs> can do that pretty you know, but you can spin one way for a while and then go the other way. Yeah. But you can have a lot of fun. And actually that you bring this up, Pete, you know, being able to to have a variety of strokes is great. It's like arrows in the quiver mm-hmm. because you exercise different body parts. J- 
just changing it up. I mean, you can look at collegiate swimmers or national team swimmers, and just with a picture, you can kind of tell who the butterflyers are, who mm. the breaststrokers are, who the sprint freestylers are, who the distance freestyle. You know, they have different body types. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, some of that is natural gift, but some of it is just developing that body type from what you're training. I mean, I've absolutely seen that over the years of body types being formed by the type of swimming that you're doing. I was looking at the combat side stroke video, and there's all kinds of distance-based strokes where you're trying to create this economy you're talking about. This one's designed to be able to move a lot of weight underwater, and so you don't spend a lot of time, like you said, coming up. You kind of roll your face, roll not onto your back, but onto your side, have your face up. You get a breath, maybe two breaths, depending on the variation of the stroke, and everything else yeah. pretty much stays under the water. That is correct. When you're doing the combat side stroke, yeah, you should have about 90% of your body under the water because you want to be as parallel to the water line, really in any stroke you do, as parallel to the water line as you can get. Okay. You know, in the way I like to teach it, if you're trying to push a piece of plywood vertical to the water line and you're in the water and that piece of plywood's underwater, that's going to be almost impossible to move. Right. And as we get the angle closer and closer to the surface of the water, then we're going to be able to, you know, have it be a little less power needed. So, you know, at a 45 degree angle, still pushing that board through the water is going to take a lot of effort. But if we just let that piece of plywood float on the top, you can really move it with your hand mm. or a couple fingers. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I teach swimming, I like to use the skating analogy that generating power is important, but it really is the slipperiness of the ice that is most important. So if you're skating on rototilled ice, you know, good luck becoming efficient, <laughs> right. being able to get from point A to point B. We want to Zamboni that. So I spend a lot of time when I teach learning to be more slippery in the water and the fundamentals of learning how to do that. Really important. And it makes it a lot more fun too. Yeah, that, and that's in some of the videos I was watching, just the, the whole idea of rough, you know, like fighting the water versus being smooth and relaxed in the water. Uh, a lot of folks that I, I have swam with, you know, who swim, who don't have a higher level of swimming, you know, yes, they can get across the pool, but it's like, why are you working so hard to get there? Like, if you could just relax a little splash a little less water, you know, and be a little more calm in the water. It's almost like there's like swimming to not drown as opposed to swimming to get somewhere. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. Yeah. I mean, most people fight the water as an ad adversary. <laughs> you know, we're never going to win because the water is calm, collected, cool. It's just going to be there. So we want to learn how to work with those water molecules, so to speak, and have them work for us instead of against us. You know, one of the things I do in working with triathletes is to get them to be balanced like we talk, talked about with the piece of plywood without needing to work their legs so hard. Because if you're a triathlete, you know, you've got the run and the bike coming up. You need to rest your legs. And even so, when I videotape almost, I'm I really mean 95 out of 100 triathletes are using their legs way too much. And most of that's just to keep their butt up because intuitively they know they shouldn't be swimming perpendicular to the water, but they still do. So they kick their legs to try to keep their hips up. And that's where we burn about 80% of our oxygen we can, and it doesn't do much for our propulsion. Right. So if I can, if I can relax the legs and learn, learn to use my body to keep myself up, boy, what a different experience swimming can be. And so... so yeah. Yeah. No, this is a good because this is where. So there's a couple. One of the reasons why I swim, a lot of my joints are beat up from a lot of combat time, heavy weight, lots of patrols, yeah. uneven surfaces. And so my hips, my shoulders, these things are just they're worn out. And uh, so I can't really even do breaststroke. I, I was never a good breaststroker anyhow, but uh, I just my body does not move in a way to create an efficient stroke at least at this time maybe one day well but, breaststroke's hard for me and i don't have all that you know dry land damage that you have yeah so i completely get it it's kind of an unnatural stroke you know breaststrokers in my mind i mean they're awesome they're kind of like the kickers in football you know yeah they kind of stand apart they're you know they have their own strengths <laughs> and uh, a lot of breaststrokers are specialists i mean that's the stroke they do Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They don't really, you know, where you see a lot of more crossover with backstrokers, butterflyers, and freestylers. But uh, but breaststroke is an absolute essential stroke, Pete. 
if you want to learn to be a good open water swimmer or a good combat side stroke swimmer, because it is the look-see stroke. That's how we look to make sure we're going straight. Right. So, right. You know, so it is really important if you want to have a tool in your tool bag to be able to swim in the open water. So I can for sure do it. It's just really inefficient when I do it and it hurts. So yeah, I right. get it. Like if I want to take a break, I'll do kind of a, a modified breaststroke where my kick isn't very wide because it just I can't go very wide anymore. And yeah. uh, I don't get very, I do the, like the more modern tighter uh, arm stroke. Cause I, if I go out wide and do like the old style, or maybe it's the new style again, these things move around, but I keep a very tight thing just to get my head up, get that breath. And, you know, I'll do that for, I don't know, a lap across the pool, but I, I don't do it for more than that because it just, I can't maintain it. So is it your shoulders that mostly hurt? Pete, or is it the legs, or just kind of feels tight for you? Yeah, it's my hips. So the hips limit my kick. I can only get so wide, and my kick has always sucked. I've tried and tried to figure out how to do it, and all I ever get told is you're not doing it right. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then, yeah, if my I'll shoulders take a have look to look at that, but I get it. Mine's not either. Yeah, and then my shoulders, I have to be very careful, even with freestyle. If I get outside of my uh, my stroke. Right. Like I try to create more efficiency. I try to coach myself in the water. But if I get a little sloppy, if I get a little tired, I for sure, like my shoulders get out of whack really fast. And then, it, you know, I have to get out of the pool. I, I just can't. Uh, yeah. And that's a good, you know, you bring up a good point. Um, most swimmers are more comfortable swimming flat on the water because it's kind of like, look, if we want to walk on a wide sidewalk or a tightrope, we're going to pick this wide sidewalk because yeah. we feel more comfortable there. Um, but when we're swimming, if we're too flat in the water, just the act of recovering those arms can be really strenuous on your shoulders. I mean, you can just do this, you know, if you just stand up straight and try to bring that elbow right behind you and lift it over the head and get your arm over the head and back in the front, it's hard. Yeah, that's not but easy. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're standing there, though, and just bring your elbow to your side, you know, parallel to your body, that's uh -huh. very easy to do. Yeah. And so when we swim, we want to have some rotation, not only because that's how we generate power and we're more slippery in the water, but it's also much easier on the shoulders on how we get the arms up. Yeah. And so a little bit of rotation is really important. The problem is, when most people rotate, they don't know how to stay balanced. <laughs> mm. They don't know what to do to stay balanced in the water. And that's why, you know, part of the, um, the videos I do, my, the recent combat side stroke video, we spend a lot of time on learning how to roll and stay parallel with the water line so you're not sinking your hips. Yeah. And if your hips sink, then the power you're generating just goes to lift your hips back up. There are so many things to keep track of in the water. And it's such a, I don't want to say monotonous, but there's time for your mind to wander, you know? And sometimes <laughs> I, I want that, you know? Like it becomes a meditation almost that you're like, oh my gosh, I'm swimming and my feet are at least 18 inches below my head. Yeah. So I'm just swimming like a wall in the water, you know? Well, but you know, what I like to do is most people I talk to that don't like to swim or, or get bored with it, mm -hmm. you know, they go and look at it as, okay, I got to get it in, but this is drudgery. And, you know, they get in and they just do laps at the pool. And I compare this to a soccer player going to the field and just running laps around the, you know, if you're playing on the football field, running laps on the track outside the field. Yeah. You know, if you do that, you could be in shape, but who are you going to want on your soccer team? Yeah. The big fat, out of shape soccer pro who at least has the skills to cover an area of the field, right? Right. Or some young buck stud who's really in shape but has never hit a ball before. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. in my mind, you're going to want the, the, the old fat, out of shape soccer pro because he's got skills. Yeah. And so in the pool, you know, we want to go in using this analogy, we want to go and and we want to dribble the ball. We want to shoot to the left side of the net. We want to shoot to the right side, hmm. up, down, all around. And when you do that, it just opens up, Pete, a whole new world to swimming. Yeah. You know, I've been doing this a long time. And I got to tell you, I am never bored with swimming, ever. Yeah. Because with all the strokes that you mentioned, with all the finer points to learn, with all the things that it can do for us physically, and I hope we can get into that in a little bit, some of the new research that's gone on about the benefits of just sitting in the water. Mm. But with all that, 
boy, it can be really just great feedback, a stress reliever, a real zen-like experience just getting in the water. Yeah, you're bringing in some things I definitely want to get into, um, but I want to be selfish here for a minute and talk about my my swim stroke because um, I liken it to a shitter sucker truck. You know, where you're like, <laughs> okay. God damn, that thing is ugly. No one wants to be near it in the pool. Um, but I'll go all day and I don't know what it is about my right. physical makeup, but as long as I stay within my body's capability and I don't mean go slow, I mean, slow compared to someone fast in the pool, but I'm convinced right now, like I could get up. I have a hernia right now. So once that gets fixed, but I can get up from my hernia recovery, I can go swim a, a mile with, you know, I mean, you give me less than an hour, I'll be done with the mile and I could do that. I could do that indefinitely. And I'm not like a, I don't push really hard off the wall. So I do 25 meter laps. Um, I t- I purposely take a very soft push because I want to mostly swim. So right. there's something in what I do that works. But also, I know there's a lot of slop in there because I do, I don't kick hard, but I constantly flutter my feet when I kick. Okay. So what do, well, what do I need to do? I mean, I don't need to go faster. I'm not competing. I don't I have no intentions of competing, but what would you recommend for a guy like me? Who's got, um, you know, his shoulders and his hips are compromised, uh, can swim all day. Wh- where can I put my effort in to try to, I don't know, just in, continue to increase my, my confidence and my enjoyment. Absolutely. Well, I think the first thing, again, that we look at is trying to Zamboni the ice. And the most important thing to do is learn really how to swim flat on the water without needing a lot of propulsion. So I like to use uh, tier TYR burners or zoomers or short fins Uh uh, to train people, because if we use large surface fins, you know, they can hide what I call a multitude of swimming sin. In other words, you know, you put on that big fin and you kick it a little bit, it's going to correct your balance. Okay. Okay. Now, fins, however, if we're out of balance yaw-wise, what I call horizontal balance, I know a lot of guys that can swim pretty fast with fins on, but you get them in the open water, can they swim straight? Mm -hmm. So, you know, they can haul, but, you know, if they can't swim straight, they have to keep lifting their head. And what does that do? Each time you lift your head, your hips sink. It's like a boat planing out and then coming out of plane. And then they gun in the gas again. What kind of gas mileage is it getting? Not very good. So, you know, one of the easiest drills to do is what I call the Superman glide. So you just, you know, push off the wall with your hands in the front and you let your head just relax in between your arms. You know, your head's in the right position. If you squeezed your arms together, if they cover your ears, that's a pretty good position for your head to be in. If it goes behind your head, your head's too low. If it's on your cheeks, your head's too high. And just kind of kick there and relax and hold the air in your lungs and do a light flutter kick with these short fins on if you've got them. And if you don't, just bare feet. But I like to use the short fins again. It just gives people without a good kick enough propulsion to be able to feel decent in the water. And we know we're improving. when We can put the fins on and feel pretty good and then take them off and feel just as good with them off as we do with them on because then we know that we're not using those fins to assist our body, right? Yeah. So, you know, just kind of kick and try to be level and flat, and you press on your lung area to get your hips up. So the the kind of visual on this is that if you're on a seesaw, most of us have been on seesaws, at least of our generation, you know, and you're, you got the fulcrum in the middle, the only way to get a heavier guy up on the other side is to do what? You really lean back on that seesaw, right? Yeah or get him to scoot up a little bit. So what happens is our center of buoyancy is around our lung area, but our center of mass is around our hip area. So we have a tendency to swim uphill. Most people do. Yeah. So we have to lean into that buoy area, which is our lungs to be able to get the hips to rise to the surface without needing too much of a flutter kick to get those hips up. Yeah. And that's one of the first and most basic drills we do Uh, with triathletes and just learning that alone, that you don't need your legs to get you parallel to the waterline. You need to readjust where you press in. It's kind of like having a basketball. I'll use this as an analogy. If I'm hanging out, let's say in the ocean or in a pool with a basketball and I'm holding on to that, I can use that as a flotation device. You know, and how much energy does it take to just lean over 
and use that basketball and put my head in the water and use that to help my hips come up. Yeah. Hardly takes any energy at all. Right. Yeah. If I take a pair of scissors and stab that basketball and all the air comes out, yeah, then I don't have much potential energy to use. So breath control, learning to keep air in your lungs, um, really important in swimming. And by the way, it's healthy to learn how to control our air. You know, you have a lot of these mindfulness people now teaching breath control and the benefits of it. You can get that while you're swimming. Yeah. This is neat, man. I really appreciate you doing this with us because, uh, you know, if nothing else, I'm getting a lot out of this episode. So <laughs> TYR.com, Burner EBP Fins is what he's talking about. And you, they're like 35 bucks. You throw them right. on your feet. And you're, you're so right. When, I, when I'm swimming, I, I, uh, when I'm paying attention, I'm constantly trying to figure out what needs tuning in my body because even though I can swim and I, I think I swim pretty well, you know, I'm, I'm not a pro or anything, but I can do a lot of different strokes. I'm comfortable. I can do, you know, there's, there's scissor kicks and, and that frog kick and there's a flutter kick, you know, there's um, the fish kick. kick, so many. So I can, I'm comfortable doing those and mixing them together, but it doesn't mean I'm swimming well on the water you know and i i think there's a lot to be said for just getting in the pool and swimming bad as you can for as long as you can until you continue to get better because when i get out of the pool i feel like a million bucks and there's something jeff there's something that that happens you must have experienced this when you get out and everybody around you like you just you have this magic moment where your vision is super clear, you know, your body is awake, and everybody just wants to chat with you and talk. And like, this <laughs> thing, wow, we just did this thing, you know? Isn't that amazing? There is something about it that's different than any other sport. You know, Rick DeMont, who was Olympic gold medalist in the 400 meter freestyle in 1972, was one of my coaches. He was a head coach at University of Arizona for a while, an assistant there for many years, Olympic coach for the, uh, uh, South Africans that won the gold medal in the 400 meter relay back in, well, I think it was Oak four. Mm. But anyway, he, st- he says, Jeff, I still swim because I feel better when I'm done. Yeah. And I was like, okay, that's awesome. You know, and that's a good enough reason Pete to do it, but we also want to feel awesome when we're doing it. You know, that's kind of the next level that we want to get there. We don't want to have to get through the drudgery to feel good at the end. There's so much that we can gain and gather while we're actually doing it. You know, going back to the soccer practice, we don't want to just feel good after we're done. We want to enjoy it, you know, while we're there. But if you don't know what to do or the drills to do or how to implement them or how, you know, the different energy systems, I teach energy systems and, and how to make the best, you know, time, the best out of the time you have in the water, depending on what you want to train for, you know, and that could be training specific. So there's so many different variables that we want to enjoy while in the water. And you're right, though. When you get out, you have that sense of accomplishment. And who needs drugs, right? Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. And who needs drugs? Boy. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Boy, your body is just switched on in the most positive way. You know, you feel stronger, you get that pump and you're, you just, you know, you feel, oh man, I just, I can't say enough great things about swimming. Uh, I, you know, I know it works for me. I really love it. I don't expect it to work for everybody, but man, if you're looking for something and, and you feel like you're too heavy to go run or that kind of thing, get in the pool and, and you're going to feel better. I want to get well, into absolutely. some of this mindfulness stuff because for sure, a good portion of my swim workout is also a mental, you know, um, just, you know, it's a very meditative sport. If you get into that zone, I often find myself without any design falling into that point where it's as almost like, I've, you know, every stroke is an ohm, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> but there is that point where I have to get into the chapel, right? So I stand on the edge of the pool and um, you have to. It's, it's not hard, but there is a barrier there between the pool yeah. and in the pool. Do you know what I'm talking about? I absolutely listen. The most ardent swimmers, that is the, you know, it's kind of like you got to pierce the veil there. Yes. You know, getting in that water. 
I used to get yelled at by my high school coach. And, uh, you know, I was a pretty fast swimmer in high school and um, came out to the University of Arizona on a, on a scholarship. And, and uh, you know, he said, Jeff, you know, out of all the things, you got a great work ethic, good example swimming, but it takes you forever to get in. And then as soon as you're in, you walk, you don't swim, you walk, you know, you do the Chinese torture. And that's what everybody is watching you do. Cut it out. And so I had to mindfully think, okay, I've got to be a good example here. Yeah. That's, but it is, there's a barrier there getting in. But once you're in you're in a different world, it's kind of like you're in outer space. It is. Yeah, it is. It's, I, I see a lot better. Like, even though I don't have like my glasses on with my goggles in the water and I'm like, how I see it's amazing. You, you see. So, I mean, not, I'm not trying to read a book or anything, but everything is so clear because you're in the water and you're right. You're you're in this different space. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits besides the health of swimming. Let's talk about some of the other benefits with just getting your body to simply in the water. Yeah, what's interesting is the Councilman Institute, Research Institute at the University of Indiana, and I didn't know this until the last few years, has done a lot of research. They actually did a 25-year study on like 40,000 people, runners, walkers, sedentary, and swimmers. And um, the research shows, and I can get this article to you, Pete, if you'd like, but the research shows that swimming above all else, and I won't get in, but significantly above running and walking will uh, help one maintain their youthful, uh, you know, their, their age, according to how they're measuring age, hmm. you know, with blood pressure, uh, with weight, with all the above. Um, it talks about that the, I don't know what they call it, but the, whatever your age markers are that swimming does these things. And then they also did a study with actual deaths and um, those that get in three times a week and spend an hour in the pool. They actually did it by yardage, but I'm, I'm kind of converting it to time in the pool. Um, the death rates are much lower huh. uh, than even those of walking and running. And so it's, it's very interesting, the health benefits They've also seen, and I've seen this empirically in, in working with uh, the Navy SEALs over such a long period of time. You know, when I first started teaching uh, with the teams, you know, swimming for, for most people is not something that they choose to do. It's just part of their operational requirements. You know, there's other things many of the guys would like to do. So it's just part of what they do. But as I, as I you know, trained for years and years, all of a sudden people did it because they had to. And then I trained people who were injured and they had to get in the water because they had to. And that's the way the fitness. But what I've seen in the last five to eight years is guys are getting in because they want to, mm. because they look at being in the water as something that can help them extend their careers. And I'll give you an example. You know, you're a military guy who took a lot of pounding, correct? Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of these guys, master chiefs, senior chiefs, officers have been pounding for years and they want to continue with their careers and they can't do the same 25 mile rucksack hike, you know, in the next day, be ready to go. Right. They're looking for other ways to stay fit. And so what they're doing is they are spending more time in the water. So I'm doing a lot more individual programs, depending on how much time they, you know, they have how many times a week, what their goals are of keeping them physically fit. And we've seen that crossover from the pool to dry land activities be very beneficial and uh, be able to extend career. So it's becoming more of a, a place they want to be to help them extend their careers and extend their physical fitness capabilities. Yeah, this is a lot like uh, hitting drills and the NFL's desire to get away from a lot of that stuff because, yes, you have to work on hitting, but, you know, finding other ways to maintain your fitness, your dexterity, all these things without damage, excuse me, damaging your body is, is, uh, you know, an important thing to creating that longevity, right? Because no one wants to get hurt in practice. No, that's not where you want to get hurt. And it's not where you want to put most of the miles on your car. Mm. I like to compare the human body. You know, we all have a certain model car. My model is a 67. I like that year, you know, the 67 <laughs> Mustangs. Corvettes, they were a pretty cool year. Yeah. You know, the muscle car. 
But, you know, today we look at the 67 cars and most of them are pretty trashed. But every so often you see one that looks pretty good. I just saw a Corvette. I don't know what year it was, but it was a 60 something uh, the other day and it looked pretty good. So, you know, depending on the kind of mileage, if we've taken it off road, all these things depend on how good our car is doing today, our own body. But I like the fact you brought up the NFL because, you know, with football players, what I'm trying to do, and I've actually talked to some of the NFL teams, but talk to them about how can we extend careers? Because there's been such a hoopla about, you know, what happens to these guys that are beat up and kind of thrown out after their careers are done. And what can they do? So a lineman's career is what? Somewhere between three and six years, I think. Mm-hmm. That's right. Big, heavy guys. And the real, what we've seen, at least, you know, empirically for me in the SEAL teams and other places, I've worked with hockey teams, basketball teams, is that if you can get these big, heavy guys, 350 pounds, and even to a lesser extent, less weighted athletes in the water on their off season for sure to supplement their dry land training, but even during the season to increase recovery rates, et cetera, that we can extend careers. So a big 350 pound lineman on the off season, instead of having him training heavy throughout the year to keep fit, you know, let's take some of the weight, you know, it's kind of like highway miles on the car rather than, uh, you know, hard off road or in city. Let's keep them fit, doing stuff in the water, and with a little bit of technical training so you don't hurt yourself. I mean, that's important, Pete. Yeah. You know, if you're going to be working hard, but you're not doing the correct, you know, you're not doing the technique correctly, then we're apt to get, you know, hip problems or shoulder problems or others. So there's a little bit of technical training that needs to happen. But after that, you know, the world the uh, has, you know, just become a totally new thing for you. My uh, my model is a Dodge 1970 A100 van with a slant six in it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. A bench seat in the front and, uh, you know, a whole lot of fur in the back. Um, See, it, I love that <laughs> analogy because the cars may not be as fancy as today, but they got character and class. Don't they? Yeah. And again, like I'm not trying to be uh, a 70, you know, Charger or a Mustang <laughs> or a Corvette because uh, – it's just not how I swim, you know, like I, I'm serious. Like, I, so I was in Iraq and uh, I was on a, um, more of a uh, I didn't go out of the wire in this one particular tour that I was on, but um, I did work a lot. And then they said, hey, we're going to have a we had a pool on this camp um, from the Iraqis. It was, it was like an Olympic sized pool and all that. And so they said, we're going to do a relay race. And it was multiple miles. Let's say it was three miles of swimming. And, you know, you grabbed your team of like five people and you swam it. And I'm like, I'm just going to swim it. I, I don't I don't need a team. And so <laughs> I just I, and I trained for two days. You know, like I was like, oh, this is going to happen, to, you know, in three days. OK. So I went out. I'm like, yeah, I can still swim. Preparing. Yeah. And and so I did it and I just, you know, I just kept going and uh, I can do that indefinitely. But I would like to I would like to add some some elegance to what I'm doing, you know, for sure. And I definitely got to find strokes or ways to stay in the pool. Like even right now, I have to activate my shoulder. It's like crunch, crunch, pop, crunch, crunch, pop, right. you know. Right. So I've got to find those motions that I can do indefinitely and uh, and not aggravate my joints. What about the spiritual side of being in the water? What does that do for us? Because I know it helps me, but what does the science say? What does your experience tell us? Well, I've learned again a lot about this recently because it used to be, you know, for me, all about my goals. You know, I uh, I was on, um, you know, I came out to the University of Arizona in 1985. Was on the junior national team before that. You know, trained for four Olympic trials. Uh, was an All-American. It used to be all about that goal of swimming faster than anybody else. And boy, that does a lot. You know, it has done a lot for me as far as life lessons, just that alone. Right. Uh, But we really, what I learned during that period of time is how to really do some hard things. Hmm. And, you know, one of the hardest swims I've ever done, the hardest swim I ever did was 1996, a 26-mile swim around Atlantic City. So it's Absecon Island. Yeah. And that was, it's not the longest swim I ever did. I did a 36 miler a couple of years ago up in uh, North Dakota. And that was uh, the longest swim, but easy compared to this 26 miler just because I got into trouble. Huh. You know, so I drank some salt water about two miles into the swim 
and these professional races, you know, there's money involved and you, you can only wear one suit, and one cap. And as you're swimming along, um, you can't touch the boat. So they hand you your, your cup of water or your Gatorade or whatever you're taking or food in a little, uh, you know, they stick out a stick. It's got a little V on it. They put it in a cup. And so two hours into a 10 hour race, I flip over and grab my cup of Gatorade and a wave comes over. It fills it up. And so I chug down about eight ounces of salt water Oh no! pretty early in the race. So when that happens, you know, if you've ever drank eight ounces of salt water, 10, 15 minutes later, you start puking. And so that's what I did. And the water temp's about 57. So in 57 degree water, if you're not keeping body heat in, you start going hypothermic. Yeah. And, if you, and then I tried to drink 20 minutes later. I couldn't keep it in. So I'm starting to cramp. My calves go first and then my quads and then my hams and then my feet and then my lats and then my triceps and biceps and forearms. And then I started cramping on things I never knew I had. Mm. And anyway, long story, because if you don't get around the first nine miles of the swim into the back bay before the current starts coming out, yeah, uh, you won't make it around. You so don't that's why. Get in. Yeah. If you don't get yeah. in, you don't get in. <laughs> right. Exactly. So it took me a few hours just to go two miles to get in. And my boat, because the waves were too uh, high in the currents, I didn't have the support boat. So anyway, by the end of the race, I did make it around, but my body core temp was 86 degrees, and that's when you're supposed to be dead. Right. And uh, my blood pressure was 50 over 30. Oh, couldn't talk. You were about you know. to die. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I knew it was close. I could feel it. Uh, I could feel your my body, just the life within me kind of coming out. I mean, you can feel it. It's really kind of a weird. But the, the re, I, I, I bring that up as a spiritual experience you know, at the last couple miles, I, I knew I was in trouble, but I didn't know, should I go really hard and to try to keep, you know, me conscious and going, or should I go easy? You know, what's going to be the better thing to do? And, you know, I went really hard. So I don't know if that's the good thing to do, yeah. but I'm still alive. The thing that very spiritual about that is I did that. There's kind of a bar, you know, that right now is my 10. Okay. And uh, every other time I've swam something even really difficult, the one I did a few years ago, the 36 miler, my left arm was pretty much gone after 30 miles. Wow. I was still able to move it, but it wasn't functioning very well. It wasn't contributing it to, yeah, okay. Yeah, it was really a single arm for the last six miles. But guess what? You know, my body core temperature was probably 95, 94, uh -huh. you know? You know, I was aware, I was able to eat and drink, you know, yeah. my calves and quads were cramping, but nothing else. And so even though that was a really hard swim, was I on the brink? No, I wasn't. Was there any time I wanted to quit? No. Was there a time I wanted to quit on the 26 miler? Absolutely. <laughs> right. But, you know, I, I think, you know, with our kids today, what I teach is, you know, do hard things, put yourself in positions of testing yourself, sign up for things. And I think that adds to the spiritual side in, in how we kind of look at ourselves and in, in what our confidence level, but also our competence level goes up. You know, we get in trouble when our confidence exceeds our competence. And we see that in guys thinking, oh, yeah, I can do all this stuff. So I think there's a connection between the physical and the spiritual is what I'm saying, Pete. And that if we have that confidence to do those hard things, we can really let go and our experiences in the water can just become, uh, I don't know, it, it, it can take our minds to a different level. And I find that more in the open water, quite frankly, okay. than I do in the pool. You know, the spirit, it's just kind of a spiritual freedom that we feel in the water uh, that you can just keep going and going and the interruption of the walls are not there. Yeah. Let me ask you, let me push this a little bit and, and see, see what happens. So my uh, girlfriend just did a two week long rafting trip down the Colorado river through the grand Canyon. And sure. uh, of the 17 people, 16 came back and the oh, other person no. just, you know, looks like they made a left on the trail instead of a right. And ended up in a, in a place where, you know, they got separated from the group 
And ultimately, you know, in a place that's as wild and as dangerous as the Grand Canyon is, and it doesn't seem like it is on the surface, but to realize that in that canyon, if you're not constantly drinking water, it's 110 degrees, if not hotter, you know, you've been out on a hike. You, you cannot get into the Colorado River safely and, and survive for long, especially without a life preserver. Like it is, it is extremely yeah. dangerous. And yeah. literally making left versus right choices have this path that you get on. So you're in a similar situation, right? Like it worked out for you. But how do you regulate as a competitive person who's trying to do hard things? How do you – Evan Tanner went off. He's a – hyper fit UFC world champion. Right. And he went off walking out in the desert and you know, yeah, a dry heat isn't as miserable as a wet heat, but you go walk the wrong direction in a dry heat. You ain't coming back. And he didn't. So how do yeah. you balance between that, that tension between like, would, would yourself today allow you to go and push that hard against death? You know, that's a good question. Even when I was in the middle of it, you know, we had a, and I was married, um, in 1990, this was in 96, we had one daughter already born. And so there's a greater responsibility, you know, of, of how hard you push yourself. Um, you know, but I, let me just kind of do the bookends here. You know, I took a scouting troop out on a trek. It was kind of a pioneer trek where we got hand carts and there were six boys to a hand cart. You put all your gear in for the camping trip in that hand cart yeah. and you push it. You know, and I think it was an eight mile hike that first day uh, till the camp out. And uh, as we were pushing the cart, it was supposed to be mostly the boys and just kind of reenact the trek across the plains, you know, that some of the pioneers took um, and how hard it was going up these dirt trails. Uh, I heard a lot of comments of, wow, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. Yes. Now, this is not life threatening. We got plenty of water. We got plenty of food. But it's, it's still, it's not Arizona in the summer, but it's in the spring or fall. I can't remember we were out, but it's still pretty hot, but yeah. we're not threatening anybody. Um, but I came to realize, I was like, wow, this is the hardest thing these guys have ever done? That's crazy. Yeah. You know, what are we doing right. uh, with our youngsters? And so I think on that bookend, we've got to go out and do that. We've got to go out into the wilderness and, and be very careful about it, but stress ourselves physically you know, not just mentally. And I got to tell you that, you know, mental work is very fatiguing as well, but physically there's a connection there and we need to do that with our young kids on the other side. Yeah. Deciding to take a hundred mile run, um, you know, in the desert with no support is just stupid. You know, it's just not being smart. Right. So I think we probably incrementally test ourselves a little bit at a time and try to find our limits but I think in this day and age, if we were to err as a whole, Pete, I would say we err too much on the side of coddling and, you know, not having a high tolerance for our own pain. And this is really why SEAL training. And again, you know, I'm not a SEAL. Right. I want your listeners to understand that. I don't pretend to be one and I am not one, but I've seen the training and I'm a tactical swim instructor for the Naval Special Warfare community and I'm honored to do that. But I think one of the things that these men learn as they go through SEAL training is just that they are capable of doing so much more than one thinks you can. And that's why when you watch these men go through hell week, which I have, um, and being able to watch, you know, the, the deterioration physically, but they keep good track of them. I mean, you know, this is, they've done it for years and years. It's not dangerous. Uh, well, it is dangerous to a certain extent, but most of the guys, you know, make it through one way or the other um, healthy. You know, they either quit or they make it through and they're, they're still there, um, but they're able to do things well beyond, um, you know, what any of us think we can do. Yeah. And I think they kind of use that as a measuring tool of, OK, I've been there before. And so at least this isn't as hard as hell week, you know. <sighs> Yeah, it's not as hard as Hell Week. And there is, yeah, you have that barrier of like, no, I've done things harder than this. I can take it. And also, there's um, there's a level of care that's in place there. Like, So for the audience, literally, some of the schools that involve water training in the military, and I would imagine not yours, but involve things that would ultimately equate to you dying. 
You know, like you were in the pool and you are about to drown. And except for the person who's pulling you out of the water, you would drown. You know, they go to exhaustion. They're trying to get comfortable in dire situations in the water. And the only way to train for that is to is to be in these impossible situations so that you do create that calm. Like this is an impossible situation, but the only way to get out, if I'm able, is to be calm, is to, you know, hope that someone else is looking out for me because I've reached the end of what I've got. And that does happen. People do reach the end and you're oh, hoping someone's got an arm to fish you out. No, one of the things I teach is, is be the Bob. So most of us have fished before with these red and white fishing bobs, you know, and you, that kind of, you, you cast it out and on a nice summer day, it just kind of floats on the top of the water and everything's calm and you got your worm underneath, but then all of a sudden a big boat comes by mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, wrecks your solitude and that bob is going up and down, but how much energy is it spending the bob when everything is calm? And the answer is zero. Right. Does the amount of energy change when the waves in the turmoil hit? Mm. And the energy and the answer to that is no. The bob is still not putting out any more energy as it was when everything was calm. Right. And so the skills and drills that I teach on the combat side stroke video I sent you are critical. Like we do one drill that it's the four corners balance drill. So you learn to be balanced horizontally and vertically on your stomach and then on your side and then on your back and then on your other side. Yeah. So you learn to be balanced at all four points of the compass. And so it shouldn't matter where you end up in the water. You could be wherever and you can still be balanced and stabilized at each four point corner. So when you're in the ocean, if you get beat up, most people only feel comfortable on their stomachs. Mm -hmm. And so if they get hit and beat up, where do they want to go back to? Yeah. You no, know, they want to reset and be there. And so there's some panic that sets in. And I teach this to triathlon swimmers as well, you know, and it shouldn't phase you in the least, you know, up to a point. Obviously, there's a point we want to get out and, you know, go have a, a cold one. But in reality, you know, if the waves are hitting you and you're feeling choppy, you, if you have those skills that you've learned in the pool, it should just be another summer day at the beach, being able to stay calm, cool and collected. Yeah. And so. Those kind of things are some of the Zen-like, you know, attributes that you can learn swimming in the pool, but then apply in the open water. You know, it's kind of like if all else around you is going to chaos, can you bring it in in a mindfulness way and focus on what you are doing instead of being too focused on what's going on around you? Yeah. Fantastic lessons about being in the pool. I love it. I love thinking all about it. And just, oh, you know, and it, it, I meant to say this earlier, but so many things come down to pitch, roll, and yaw in terms of dealing with energy and whether you're in a flight, in a car, and maybe you don't call it pitch, roll, and yaw in this particular discipline or that particular, but it, I mean, it is, it is, it's the same yeah. thing, right? Yeah. No, I mean, uh, you know, my degree is in aerospace engineering, so I relate to that very well. Yeah. Yeah. Like in, in a car, you call it tow. You know, and then there's they just have different names for the same three axes. Wh which one do you think is is the most problematic for for swimmers as they try to establish their ability to you know safely get across the body of water? The, you know, is is it one? Is it all of them? Which one is well, the hardest well, one to correct? Maybe the most critical is the pitch, or okay. what I call you know vertical balance. Because right. if you just hang out in the water and do a dead man's float, your hips sink and your feet are at the bottom. So we want to get more to that parallel. So I don't know if that's, I think that's probably the easiest to learn. Okay. But it's also the most critical. So yeah. that's the Zamboni going over that ice, kind of rough ice, making it a little smoother. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the harder to learn, it goes in this degree. This is the first one you need to learn is the pitch just to be totally balanced in that water. And then more difficult to learn is the roll while staying balanced. Mm. So that's a little harder and that would come second. And then a lot of times the hardest to learn is being able to stay balanced vertically and horizontally and still go straight. So when you're in the open ocean, you know, uh, you can be balanced one way <laughs> and the other, but we tend to go in the direction our head and hands are pointed. Yeah. Yet we have a balanced kick. So when I'm teaching team guys, because most of them do swim with fins on. Yeah. 
And uh, one way to test this, you can do some vertical kicking with fins on. If you can close your eyes and put your hands out of the water, your heads up, and you kick with your eyes closed with your fins, you should be able to stay in place for, you know, 20 to 30 seconds. Right. If you're kicking and you tend to go backwards, your front sweep is more powerful than the back and vice versa. You'll go forwards if the back sweep is, you know, more powerful than the front. So we need to get all these things in alignment. You know, that if we want to be able to go to the open water, swim efficiently, straight, using our fins in the, in the appropriate way. But all those things take time to learn, you know, but they all add up to, you know, a competency that will pay off big time if you really want to go out there and do some fun open water swimming and really be able to be in that Zen-like spiritual state that you can just enjoy, mm. you know, the surroundings and where you're at. And uh, if things get a little rough, not panic when others around you may be doing so. So when you're doing like a, a just a standard backstroke and you're banging up against something or, you know, you just, you, you know, it's the hardest one to go straight in. Uh, at least I think. Sure, backstroke's tough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a yaw problem, but you're saying it's a balance problem because something in your stroke or your kick or even your body orientation is, is trending left or right. Is that, is that right? That is correct. Okay. You know, you, again, your head could be tilted one way or the other. Your stroke on the right may be a little imbalanced with the left. Your kick may be a little different as you rotate one way from the other. Right. Um, so, you know, I'll do a lot of simulated open water swimming in the pool. And you say, Jeff, what is that? Well, yeah. close your eyes. You know, can you go in a 25 yard or meter pool from one side to the other without hitting the lane line, closing your eyes? Mm -hmm. And you may think, oh, that shouldn't be that hard. And it's not that scary. Try it. <laughs> yeah. And, and as an old guy, you know, look, I'm not as fast as I used to be. And there's a lot of pool swimmers uh, that are faster than me. But when the conditions are rough in the open water and those fast pool swimmers don't have a lot of open water experience, you know, I can beat them. And this is why. Let me give you an analogy on this. Yeah. So let's say we're in a gym and all the lights are on. And we're running, you know, however long a basketball court is, I don't know. And we're running sprints, you know, and I'm running as a 51 year old man against these young bucks. I'm going to lose, uh -huh. you know, we're going to, cause I, you know, but I can still run straight and I'll know when to stop, but they're going to be going back and forth a lot quicker than I am. Right. Okay. So let's say we turn all the lights off <clears throat> now and it's completely pitch dark in that gymnasium. Okay. How many of those young bucks are going to run as fast as they did with the lights on? Right. Zero. Yeah. And why is that? Because they haven't practiced it. Yeah. And even if you know there are no chairs in your way, even if you know it's an, it's an open gym, you still got other guys you might run into. So can you run as fast and can you run as straight? And the answer is usually no. Hmm. So the way yeah. as an old guy, I can still compete with the young guys is I know how to run straight and I know how to run fast and I know when the end of the line is in a dark gymnasium. So yeah. one of the, one of the human intuitions, you know, or we have is the one we want to know where we're at at all times. So when I get in and swim with these young guys, you know, they're always pulling their head up going, where am I at? Where uh -huh. am I at? And then three or four more strokes later. And this is, you know, this is, um, one of the ways I won the Alcatraz swim a couple years ago because it was bad conditions and, you know, there was rain and fog. And, you know, as we took the boats out and all the swimmers were on the boats and the conditions got worse, they were saying, should we cancel the race? And I was like, I sure hope not because this is the only year I got a chance. <laughs> you know, the worse the conditions, the better chance I have. Is, and I wasn't the fastest swimmer in that group by any stretch of the imagination. Right. When I had a lot of practice swimming – in a dark gymnasium straight without needing to know exactly where I was at every, in every given moment. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of uh, rough ice for those guys. And there was a lot like, of rough I, ice. For those I guys. love rough ice. Yeah. <laughs> My technique, Jeff is to uh, get on the lane line and just. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> no, but you're right. When you, even when you swim face down in the water, 
if you are able to swim in a straight line with your eyes open, you're correcting. You're using energy to get your body in the right position. And if you are a dog legger, you would never even necessarily know it, you know, because. Well, no, I mean, with a bicycle, at least, if you're not totally aligned, your steering wheel is going to be a little off. Yeah. You know, we've been on those bikes in the old days where you had to crank it a little to the right just to go straight. Yeah. If you put the handlebar straight, you'd veer off. It's, uh-huh. it's like. You know, so everybody swims like that, but they have the the line at the bottom, so they don't know it. Right. And so you are burning efficiencies, even though you don't know it. Right. You know, with a bike, you have that instant feedback. And that's why I'm a fan of, let's do some eyes closed swimming. And so in the pool, when we get guys in and train, you know, without fins on, it'll take a couple strokes for somebody to hit the lane line. When you put fins on, you would be amazed. Even in a 50 meter pool, I'll pull all the lane lines out. So it's Uh 25 yards across 50 meters long. And I've had guys hit the wall within two strokes of side stroke. Yeah. I mean, hit the left or right wall, Jesus. you know, going back crooked with the eyes closed. Yeah. And they think they know how to swim the stroke correctly. And I'm not picking on, this is not Navy guys. This is humans in general trying to learn freestyle or side stroke you know, two strokes, side stroke, four strokes, freestyle. I've seen them go, you know, depending on how they're using their legs uh, and the pauses they're taking, crank all the way from the middle of the pool and hit that left side. So you got to be careful when you're doing eyes closed stuff. You don't want broken fingers. Right. Or bashed up. So you got to make sure you give yourself a wide berth. But there's a lot one can learn from that, even if you are just a pool swimmer. Yeah. Boy, that is because yeah, you're right. Like if you had a car and you're passenger front right tire had 15 degrees of of toe in it more than it was supposed to or yaw um the car will push itself forward but you will absolutely wear that other tire out 50 times faster than the other tires because it's always absolutely yeah and it's the same thing when you're swimming all that energy that's drawing you to the side of the pool instead of towards the other end of the pool is energy you have to overcome somewhere so something is being worn out Absolutely. And what fun yesterday. I mean, you know, this is what I do. And I just did a set of 10 100s that I would meters. I wasn't worried at all about time. All I was concentrating on was my y'all. Yeah. Is making sure that I could do those 50s. You know, I'd go eyes closed down and eyes open back. Uh-huh. And where am I tending to pull to? And you may pull one direction if you're breathing one side and a different direction if you're the other side. Or if you've got a front snorkel on, and by the way, I already talked about the tear burners or the zoomers are really good tools. The best tool of all that a swimmer can use to really help with their stroke is a front snorkel. Okay. You know, putting a front snorkel on because you can do a lot of drills that are advanced drills. And when we take out the breath or needing the breath, it takes advanced drills and makes them more basic. And when we make drills more basic, it takes a little bit longer to learn the skill, but it, it enables me to have more positive uh, muscle memory check marks. You know, and I know there's no muscle memory, so to speak, but I use that terminology because people get it. But we ingrain it into our, you know, our neuro system of how to do it right. So these front snorkels, you know, tear makes one. And I'm not a tear rep, by the way, <laughs> but other other uh, swimming outfits, uh, Speedo makes one and, and uh snorkels are really good because we can just laser focus on some of the aspects of our stroke that we otherwise can't focus on because we're constantly interrupted by needing to get us a breath yeah yeah it turns out when you're working your body hard it's crazy you know it really is crazy like um what i try to do and i'm not professing to be great at this but i try to keep my breath at a cadence that i can maintain you know, every now and then I'll get frisky and I'll do uh, every fourth stroke just just to push myself and do some breath control. Or I'll try to, like, take only one breath on the whole lap. And I'll do that for, like, you know, a certain amount of time. But my normal swimming cadence is every every right side stroke, I take a breath. Right. And so it is really hard to focus on other aspects because you're always... You're always working on taking that breath because you're working hard. It's like running. I want to breathe in. I want to breathe out. I want to breathe in. And the longer, if I can control my breath, I, I can perform better. But it does compromise my ability to focus on other things. You're right. I need to get a snorkel. Well, and absolutely. And talk about the, you know, the spiritual or zen-like aspect you know, of swimming. 
um, I work for the mindfulness guy, PhD out of Stanford. And he has a journal and one of his mindfulness exercises is he tells people, write three things down every day you're grateful for, you know, or that went well for you today. And he said, you know what? The, the biggest thing I'm grateful for every day, he says, is he goes, air. Hmm. He goes, you want something to be grateful for? Just hold your breath for 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> and then breathe, you know? And uh, air feels so good when you're swimming. I really uh, would also recommend some lung buster type drills. And, and again, mindfulness experts do breathing exercises. You can do that while you're swimming. Right. You know, to where, you know, on 150, you may breathe every time to the right. So breathe every two, then the next 50, every three, the next 50, every four, go to every five. And you may be able to go up all the way to nine, depending on what you're doing. But here's the thing. The more efficient your stroke is and the less oxygen you're burning, uh, the more strokes you'll be able to take before you need that air. So it's one of those self tests to be able to give yourself is how long can I go without needing that air? Yeah. You know, how efficient is my, what kind of fuel uh, am I burning? And if you're able to go further and, you know, longer, it's, you know, look, we have these tests, but it makes it fun, you know, closing with your eyes closed. <laughs> you know, if you're kicking your legs too much to keep your butt up, you're not going to be able to go nine strokes for very long without getting a breath. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to need that. And I'm also not one that recommends long breath holding because look, you know, we've had people die from holding their breath too long underwater and these kind of things. So be careful about that. Uh, but I think it is a good exercise to do uh, just a little bit of breath holding because you can concentrate on your stroke. You can see what kind of gas mileage you have. Yeah. Literally and, and, gas mileage. It is gas it, that it is. is stopping your mileage, right? So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the, exercises the pararescue jumpers have to do when they go through their air force training is they do up to 10 fifties or more where they're swimming underwater down and then freestyle back with only a few seconds rest between the fifties. Wow. So if you don't know how to swim underwater with a real long stroke and burning little oxygen, guess what? You're not going to make it. Yeah. And that's yeah. some of the hardest training that underwater holding breath. Um, you know, we have to learn how to be long, you know, make sure we use our air efficiently. But it's a lot of fun to teach people how to do that because they don't realize how much energy they're wasting Yeah. until you actually teach them how to save their oxygen. I love doing the underwater down. I love doing the uh, Patrick Duffy man for Atlantis porpoise stroke. I just, <laughs> okay. I think it's a riot. I love to do it. And that's why I do it because because it's fun to do. But, yeah, I would never make. I don't know if I could make 25. Maybe I could work up to 25 yards, but it's so physically demanding and inefficient that uh, it's only fun for so long. You know, then you have to stop. It is. It's it's not easy, but just with a few little tweaks and learning the strokes mm -hmm. and, you know, how to be balanced underwater and how to get the full pull and the relaxing kick and the recovery. You know, I've seen people be able to double their distance in a matter of just, you know, really like a half an hour lesson. Yeah. Well, listen, Jeff, well, I, I've had a great time with this conversation. It's just so neat to talk about swimming. I, I love doing it. And, and I know not everybody out there is a swimmer, but I think what we're illustrating here is that, you know, like anything, there's a lot of discipline in the discipline that you have to master. And you absolutely cannot get out of a pool after swimming and, and feel anything other than great. I mean, it's just such a fantastic exercise. So for those of us out there that enjoy swimming or have their mind on it let's go let's go swim let's go get in the water and make sure you check out jeff's stuff he's got his regular website which is his name jeffutch.com and then you have the other website and there's like some reading material on here but it's streamlineperformance.com and you can absolutely extend your career by getting in the water absolutely and also just so you know pete if you're in san diego we have our annual Around the Island Memorial Swim in Coronado, September 21st of this year. I'll do and my best so, to make that. That sounds great. Yeah, it'll be a fun time. I swim all the way around. A couple other guys will, but mostly we have relays. So we have a couple big yachts, and the people are on, and they'll swim 20-minute legs. Most people wear fins, and uh, they just go as far as they can in 20 minutes, and then the boat picks them up, catches them up to everybody, and the next guy goes. So it really doesn't matter how fast you are or – Whatever it is, we have a good time 
uh, and it's a memorial swim to remember the fallen uh, from the Naval Special Warfare community. Individually, each relay swims for a specific individual. We remember them, what they did, their sacrifice. I'm big into remembering because I think, you know, it sweetens our own life. We yeah. remember that sacrifice and we're grateful for what we have. And, and I so, bet if you gave them a shot, including Peter Schaub, who died this week in the water, I, I bet they would uh, be like, yeah, I would go do that if I had one more thing to do. You know, they, they would right. take that opportunity. So we shouldn't. Pete, I appreciate what you do. Thank you for this opportunity and a pleasure. 